Good evening and welcome to the May 22nd, 2018 San Bruno City Council meeting. Vicki, um, we now called it to order and we first of course and foremost want to thank the San Bruno Garden Club for providing the floral arrangement. Thank you for making sure that was taken care of Vicki. Roll call please. Council Member Medina. Here. Council Member O'Connell. Here. Council Member Salazar. Here. Vice Mayor Davis. Here. Mayor Medina. Here. Val, may I ask you to lead us in the pledge this evening? We have some announcements this evening. First, um, fr on the, we have the fifth annual Community Day in the San Bruno City Park event, which will be held on Sunday, June the 3rd. And of course, that will be uh, held after the 78th annual Posey Parade, which will begin at 11 a.m. on San Mateo Avenue at Keynes Avenue and goes all along El Camino Real and Crystal Springs Road to the City Park for the Community Day. Also, prior to that, from 11.30 a.m., I'm sorry, from 8.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m., the San Bruno Fire Association is having their annual pancake breakfast at the Central Station. You can come have a good breakfast, get ready for the Posey Parade, and, and get a tour. Item B, the City Council budget study sessions will be held on Monday, June 11th at San Bruno City Hall on Tuesday, the 12th, at the San Bruno Senior Center, and tentatively for Monday, June 18th. This evening we have a presentation and we are fortunate to have Christina Fernandez with us and we're going to receive a presentation on the San Mateo County's Get Us Moving Initiative for Transportation Funding. Good evening Mayor Medina and City Council members. Thank you so much for having Get Us Moving San Mateo County here tonight. Um, we're excited to share with you what we've learned in phase one and what we're planning for phase two. So San Mateo County has a whole host of um, obviously uh, traffic conditions um, and we are using Get Us Moving San Mateo County as a way to learn from our community um, what residents think about transportation funding and how it should be spent. Last year, um, Assemblymember Mullen um, had uh, AB 1613, had authored AB 6 1613, which would allow a half cent sales tax and it could provide $80 million per year. It does need a two-thirds approval from the county voters, and it could be placed on the ballot for, in November of this year. Um, it will only go to the voters at the Sam Trans Board and the County Board of Supervisors approve it first. So in phase one, we've gathered feedback from the community. We had 140,000 surveys mailed, um, 10,000 surveys distributed by hand, 120 participa participants at four town hall meetings, 50 presentations to city councils, business, community, and civic groups, eight stakeholder and technical advisory groups. We did outreach on TV, social media, and we also did some polling. We received over 14,000 responses, and as you will see, we heard uh, consistent themes uh, regarding what the residents were concerned about the most, including highway traffic, local congestion and potholes, as well as improving transit service. This is a word cloud. Um, in phase one, we had a comment box and folks were free to fill in whatever they would like, any comments. And these were the most prevalent comments, as you will see con congestion and traffic were the most, uh, appeared the most. As for the survey results, uh, the top priorities, uh, we asked, um, we asked residents to pick their top five out of 12 options, and the top five included highway traffic, local congestion, potholes, transit mobility, and transit time. Uh, you can also see transit mobility, transit travel time, and transit for commuters um, are all public transit categories. And if you take all of those together, there is a, there is a concern uh, regarding improved public transit. It's one of the leading community concerns. 
We also looked at, we took the mean of the scores, and so the top priority would garner, would garner five points, the second priority four points, and the third priority three points. The mean score allows us to see the true sense of priorities because it takes into account the full ranking. And regardless, um, we had the same consistent themes as we did uh, even if you hadn't taken the mean into account. Highways and local streets, pothole repair, and improved public transit were the key, is key issues for the community. This is the breakdown by city. We uh, were very successful in hearing from all corners of the county, and we did outreach to north, mid, south, and coast side. We also did some polling. So even with more than 14,000 responses, um, surveys are self-selective, and we did some high-quality scientific polling. There was a clear preference with voters for the 30-year sunset, and so that's what we're moving forward with in for, for phase two. And um, that's what I'll show you next. This is, this is an initial polling question. Shall San Mateo County Transit District's ordinance levying a 30 year half cent sales tax with independent citizen oversight providing 80 million annually that the state cannot take away might be adopted and that's to reduce traffic congestion on highways 101 280 92 84 and interchanges repair potholes maintain streets and reduce local traffic maintain and enhance transit services for seniors and people with disabilities improve and expand caltrain and samtran service to reduce travel times and car trips and implement the san mateo county traffic improvement plan so as you can see, support um, has increased over the past polls. It's now at 74%, whereas last year, um, during the initial test, it was 65%. We also tested positive messages, which included things like uh, the state could not take away, um, take away the funding, and our local streets and roads are falling apart. Uh, the measure will help stop the deterioration. The measure would help reduce traffic congestion on freeways and major streets like El Camino Real. The measure will attract millions of dollars in state, federal, and private matching funds. And after hearing positive arguments, 78% support the measure. We also tested negatives. And despite hearing negative arguments, 72% um, still support the measure. This suggests that the ballot question as tested in the survey is in alignment with resident priorities. So the, the themes are pretty consistent. Traffic on highways and local streets, potholes, and transit. We had four town hall meetings. Um, at the San Mateo Library, Menlo Park Senior Center, Pacifica Community Center, and the South San Francisco Council Chambers. And we heard the same consistent themes. Um, traffic on highways, potholes, and transit. Um, some of them did vary. In Menlo Park, Dumbarton was a huge issue. On the coast, um, besides potholes, uh, residents wanted more bus service. North County, there was an emphasis on smart transit and best practices. And Mid County wanted big highway and infrastructure projects. We also have stakeholder and technical advisory groups. Each city was invited to participate in the TAG and dozens of community groups, organizations, and the private sector were active in the stakeholder advisory group. And with that, we are now launching our budget challenge. It is um, at the same website as phase one, getusmovingsmc.com, and it allows you to allocate the 2.4 billion according to your own priorities and see how you would budget that money. This is an example of the budget tool um, it basically asks, with new funding, how much should go where? And the categories include highway, repair potholes, reduce local congestion, public transit, eliminate traffic, backups at Caltrain crossings, bike pedestrian, and Dumbarton crossing. So we are hosting a second round of town hall meetings. We've had two in North and Central County. And we are, our next one is on Thursday in Half Moon Bay, and then next uh, on May 31st in Redwood City. And we would ask you all to please join us and get the word out. So if you could all please help spread the word about Get Us Moving and encourage uh, your networks to please uh, 
take the budget challenge so we can make a, a really well-informed decision going forward. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Christina. Any questions from council, colleagues? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Before we move on uh, to consent, I'm going to uh, ask the city manager in regards to the uh, one of the items under uh, conduct of business. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council. Um, staff is requesting that we pull item number nine uh, D under the conduct of business section of the agenda related to an, the annual process for purchasing uh, vehicles that need replacement or, or that are new to our vehicle and equipment fleet. Um, we would also respectfully request that the mayor appoint a subcommittee of the city council to do some review of the, of the various issues that council members may be interested in based on questions that I have received prior to this evening um, and to assist staff in making sure that we're bringing forward an item that is um, consistent with the city council's interests and priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody okay with that? So, I'd be interested to hear. Okay. Um, so we're okay with it being pulled. Uh, requests came from the manager and staff for a subcommittee to be appointed. I'd like to ask if uh, Laura Davis and Marty Medina would be willing to serve. Absolutely. Thank okay. Yes. Okay, good. So what I'd like to see is uh, once you meet with staff is to bring back so that we really have clearly defined a process. So I remember being on staff too, and so we do our budgets and we do capital improvements. So staff brings forward these items, and now they bring them back to say, okay, so you've approved it, now we're just coming with the formalities and the exact price tag, and then questions arise, which are fair, and that's what we're here for. So I think it would be great if we have a process of what staff should bring back f forward to council and for the community that helps address those questions and uh, helps keep us on task and uh, make the process more efficient. So um, you'll present back to the city council and I appreciate both of you uh, doing that. Vicki, consent, please. Consent, all items are considered routine or implemented in earlier act council action and may be enacted by one motion. There will be no di separate discussion unless requested. Any action or, or comment that would like to be made? Morning. Um, yes, as a matter of fact, I just wanted to, uh, to recognize the service of Perry Peterson, who's resigning from the uh, Planning Commission. He, he served a long time, and uh, I just wanted to wish him well and appreciate his, his uh, service to our city. Thank you for bringing that up. I did go to the <clears throat> Planning Commission meeting, how you served, I would not say, close to 30 years or something th there with, uh, with his community, and he's uh, moving uh, to where family is, out of state. But uh, he has uh, brought a lot to the community and a lot of uh, dedication. So thank you. Any action on consent? Move to approve. Second. There's been a motion and a second to approve consent. All those in favor say aye. 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 Let's oppose no. Okay. There are no um, public hearings. Report of committee commissions and boards. We are going to receive the annual report from the Citizens Crime Prevention Committee. I'm going to turn it over uh, to our chair. Deanna Robinson, please. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of City Council and residents of San Bruno. Um, as you know, my name is Deanna Robinson, and I am the chair of the Citizen Crime Prevention Committee. I would like to take just a moment to introduce some of our members, uh, some that are actually here today and some that were unfortunately not able to make it. Uh, we have um, actually Rhonda Boone, who is a member at large, Peter Carey, who is actually here and will be helping me pres uh, to present today, uh, Mary Mahon, who is our vice chair, um, and Val Morgan, who is also member at large, and Robert Reichel, who will also be helping with our presentation today, as well as Richard Wong, member at, at large. And I'd like to thank our council member and committee liaison, Marty Medina, 
And of course, a very special thanks to Officer Sherry Campbell, who's our police department liaison. Um, <clears throat> As you know, the Citizen Crime Prevention Committee partners with San Bruno Police Department to support various initiatives that we will be reviewing this evening. But more importantly, we engage the residents of San Bruno to get involved with their community. I'd like to just spend a moment to kind of share my own personal experience. Um, several uh, months ago, uh, we were unfortunately um, had a home burglary, uh, which was um, quite devastating and it was also a violation. Um, but thankfully, I was able to reach out to this amazing committee, and they helped myself and my fellow neighbors start our own neighborhood watch group. Um, since that time, I would say we have had absolutely no issues, not only in our neighborhood, but also throughout our entire area, which is in the Portola Highlands. Um, I think more importantly, we've been able to expand the knowledge of our local neighbors and been able to get um, much more familiar with the um, neighbors at large in our particular area. One thing that I find really interesting with this process is that um, over the holidays, we've been able to ensure that we're kind of keeping tabs of who's out on vacation, been able to kind of help each other in terms of deliveries. But this is actually an approach that we took, personally my husband and I, very reactively. And part of what our committee does is really help to engage community um, in a much more proactive manner. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Peter Carey, and he's gonna share a little bit more of the activities that we've done so far. Thank you. Good evening. Neighborhood watch programs are uh, one of the main aspects of our uh, committee, assisting uh, existing neighborhood watch groups. Neighborhood watch groups total so far is 32 in the city encourage formation of groups, work with residents who have expressed interest in Neighborhood Watch, and advertise Neighborhood Watch programs. Okay. Thank you. National Night Out proclamation for this event held at na Neighborhood Gatherings, Police Recognition Day, which of course we had this last weekend at Tanfran, assist with and participate, set up, and take down, provide crime prevention literature for the public. Assembly and Mullins Health Fair at Tanfran, we staffed a information booth, Operation Clean Sweep, where we offered information on neighborhood watch groups. National Night Out with our uh, chief. Thank you. Police Recognition Day at the Tanfran, a couple of our committee members. Assemblyman Mullins Health and Safety Fair, where once again we gave out literature. Operation Clean Sweep with uh, a couple of our members. And now we'll turn it over to Crime Prevention. The, some of the activities and accomplishments continuing, we distributed our Safety and crime prevention information, uh, neighborhood watch and reporting suspicious activities. Both of these brochures uh, we developed, the committee developed over the years. We have them placed in City Hall, in the library, senior center, and last year we started also putting them in the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the rec center, and we make them available to the San Bruno Chamber of Commerce. So any of the chamber members or interested members coming in can uh, obtain them. When we have our, our safety and crime prevention literature on, on Neighborhood Watch, that's in there twice. We have a DNA, DNA collection making kit, a real simple way to uh, collect yours or your children's uh, DNA without contaminating it and putting it away. Hopefully it'll never have to be used, but if, it, if your child goes missing and the police department asks for a, a DNA sample, hopefully that would give them some uh, <clears throat> additional means of uh, finding them. The reporting the suspicious activity form is another one of the uh, forms that we cannibalized a little bit off of a uh, similar form when one of our members worked for the uh, Oakland PD and we have uh, child safety information and more. 
we, we shared informational slideshow at the uh, safety fair. It's about a 10 minute uh, revolving slide projection on the, on the screen that one of our members did a couple of years ago. I think we showed it to you once or two years ago. And that uh, just shows a lot of the uh, activities that were actually been involved in. And we're continue to maintain communication with our neighborhood watch groups. We distributed, continue to distribute crime prevention tips on uh, San Bruno cable television. Uh, we're doing it both in uh, English and Spanish. We usually uh, run two a month, two different ones, about two weeks worth. And Miriam and her staff of many, or one, at uh, San Bruno cable uh, consistently give us the support that we need there. We have coordinated uh, meetings with through the San Bruno Police Department. We had uh, residents in that were interested in the neighborhood watch program. We had one just with interested neighbors, and then we had a second one where we uh, talked more with the uh, block captains so that uh, we could meet them all in, uh, in one place. And I think we put on here we, we also, I've read this over, but I forgot whether it was in there. We, we had one meeting where we met with the uh, disaster preparedness slash CERT uh, members to see if the uh, crime prevention through the neighborhood watch may uh, be able to increase the uh, city's ability to have more CERT people trained. So that's one of the programs that we are working forward on. We've updated the postings on the uh, San Bernardino Park crime prevention committee webpage. Uh, we had, we pros, uh, proposed some additional additions to the uh, webpage and uh, we prepared national night out flyers to be distributed by the block captains and also distributed to the general public. We planned and participated in multiple locations on August 1st last year, national night out. The uh, police department and the fire department was very supportive they had uh, personnel and equipment at Grundy Park and at least one, if not two, of the uh, neighborhood meetings where uh, we had the, the neighborhood watch people congregate. We obtained pencil stickers and uh, coloring books. We got the coloring books from one of our state legislators that we could uh, make available at some of our information tables like at the health fair or at the just completed uh, police day. And we also obtained a child DNA kit for distribution. We gave a few of those out this last uh, Saturday. And I think I'm supposed to stop there. I don't have my page in front of me, but. Great. So now I'd like to share with you some of the goals that we have for both this year and next year. Uh, we're really excited because we, we actually kind of uh, coined a couple of key uh, phrases, which is outreach, connect, and engage. Um, as it pertains to outreach, we, as Robert had mentioned, have been uh, working with the community emergency response team. Um, we really recognize in this day and age, it is not a matter of uh, if, but it's really a matter of when we actually have a natural disaster. Um, so knowing that, we feel it's really important to see, you know, what opportunities we might have. Um, many of our members are CERT certified, which we feel is a, a really important component. And some of the things that we're looking at is how do we engage block captains to get more engaged in this very important topic. One of the things we're looking at is a thing called uh, Map Your Neighborhood. It's a great tool that residents can utilize to really get to know their neighbors, but more importantly, identify perhaps people that are elderly that may need assistance in the event of an emergency. Um, it also helps people to identify maybe uh, certain people may have skills such as um, maybe they work in the fire department, uh, may have emergency response, perhaps nurses or doctors. All of that information will be absolutely critical. So we're really looking at how do we continue to hone that information, share it with community emergency response team and that committee so that we can continue to kind of um, holistically and collaboratively partner and work together. Another key thing that we're looking at is being able to continue to connect with the community, and that's mostly through expanding Neighborhood Watch in a very proactive manner, I'd like to say, and not um, hopefully resulting in a situation that myself and my husband encountered. 
Um, we're doing that through participation in the National Night Out, which is actually coming up in August, and we're super excited about that. Um, we're also looking wherever we can to assist the police department with different initiatives and projects. Um, we're also looking at what we can do to engage, and I think that uh, both Peter and Robert shared with you a lot of the efforts that we have to date, so I'm not going to state each of those verbatim, but you can actually see a lot of the activity that we have. <coughs> so some of those items, um, as we've mentioned earlier, are participating in community events. Um, I do want to highlight that the recent uh, police day activity that we just had this past Saturday um, actually resulted in about close to a dozen uh, recruits um, for Neighborhood Watch. Uh, some of us were a little bit aggressive <laughs> to finding out who our <laughs> residents were and if they didn't have a Neighborhood Watch, we were like, let us give you some information. So we're super excited about that. Uh, we're gonna continue to do other activities such as the Health and Safety Fair. We have the Posey Parade that's coming up on June 3rd, so do look for our booth out there. And if you haven't signed up yet, um, be prepared to sign up. Um, and then we're continuing to collaborate with other committees. So at this point, I would like to say a very special thank you to the City Council. Um, of course, our liaison, Marty Medina. A uh, very special thanks to Chief Ed Barberini and uh, to Officer Sherry Campbell and Officer uh, Howard Hoyer, who actually helped step in last year. Um, and I would also um, like to encourage the public to attend our meetings. Uh, they happen um, the second Thursday of every month at 7 p.m. at City Hall. Um, conference room is 113. Our agenda is typically neighborhood watch and event planning, but definitely um, members of the public are welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. Any questions or comments from council? Marty, please. I just wanted to thank you very much. You, you, these people work very hard. And, and what we're trying to do is, is increase the safety in your neighborhood. So if you haven't yet, Joined a, neighbor, na joined a neighborhood watch group, come to one of the meetings. It, how, how much effort does it take to, to be in the neighborhood watch group? Maybe you can share um, Actually, you. it doesn't really take much effort at all. If, if, if anything, it's actually a lot of fun. Um, you really get to know your neighbors. I know that when we did our first kickoff, I think we started at 7, and we had to help escort people out about 11 p.m. Um, but it was like the first time we really had like this, you know, broad gathering of people, and we've had several uh, events since then. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we've also enlisted um, the interest of dog walkers because they're a perfect um, advocate for this program. They're out there day in and day out. They have to walk those dogs because dogs need exercise and they need activity. And so they're the eyes and ears of our neighbors and uh, you know what's happening in our respective areas. Um, so it's, it's really an easy process and program, and it's a great way to kind of get to know your neighbors. And thank you very much, Deanna, Peter, Robert, Val, Sherry, thank you for being here. Thank you for your presentation and to the whole committee on behalf of the City Council. Thank you. Um, it may have been a long time ago, but I was once on the Crime Prevention Committee too as a, as a much younger man. Um, and, and I know that this committee has done many things from uh, spearheading graffiti ordinance, the first one, from uh, having restrictions on where alcohol could be utilized within our park system. And so it has made a continuous difference. So I wanna thank you very much. And if you could take back to the committee, we appreciate it. Okay, Vicki. Item nine, excuse me, item eight, public comment for our items not on the agenda. It is the council's policy to refer matters raised in this forum to staff for investigation and or action where appropriate. The Brown Act prohibits the council from discussing or acting upon any matter not agendized pursuant to state law. And I do have one speaker card here, um, but if you do want to speak, you can also just stand at the back of the room and, and have your turn. So this is from Jim Evangelist, 105 DeSoto Way, and he has a question or a comment about schools. Um, good evening. Good evening, um, Jimmy. Um, I, I understand that the uh, <clears throat> El Crystal Elementary School is up for sale. And uh, I also have learned recently that uh, it's, uh, there's a right of first refusal from other public agencies uh, prior to the sale to the public which uh, offers apparently a, a discount to it. I would suggest that uh, it might not be a bad idea for the council to look into purchasing that and utilizing it for uh, re uh, other um, 
activities within the city government. For instance, record uh, storage for the police, uh, auxiliary, uh, auxiliary library. Um, there's many new, uh, many different uses that these buildings are still in good shape, uh, and it's a fairly large footprint. It has provides parking, uh, depends on the use. Uh, I know otherwise it's going to end up uh, in the open market, and it's probably going to be designated for mixed use, that is residential and retail. And it just doesn't seem like that would be a great fit for the neighborhood because of the way it's situated. It backs up to courts in that particular area. So um, if the city council, I know it's difficult to find uh, that kind of money for something like this, um, but if you could uh, think about leveraging uh, loans based on some property we already, already own, sell some other property, this is an outstanding opportunity to buy something below market value that could, we could uh, ultimately use even if you added it to, to the main city park as well. Um, I think this is something I would hope you look into before it goes to the open market. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else uh, from the audience who'd like to speak on items that are not on the agenda? Please. Thank you. Good evening, Council. My name is uh, James Casey Spingola, born and raised in San Bruno. I've come here tonight with a message of hope to those who hear it and a warning to those who don't. On April 10th, I learned that my 11 dental amalgam silver fillings from the same dentist here in San Bruno were responsible for my endless battle with severe suicidal depression for over 20 years. It has been known that mercury is the second most toxic heavy metal neurotoxin on planet Earth and sits and, and is 50%, I'm sorry, and silver fillings contain 50% liquid mercury by weight, sitting inches from the brain. Slowly but surely, releasing, releasing invisible and odorless mercury vapor that accumulates throughout the body from chewing, brushing, drinking hot or carbonated liquids. These silver fillings are still very legal and prevalent in America today. At least 70% of Americans have at least one. Women with silver fillings pass mercury through the placental barrier and, to contamin and contaminates breast milk. Considered a biohazard before and after it's in one's mouth, the Environmental Protection Agency states there's enough liquid mercury in one silver filling to contaminate a 10-acre lake. My therapists and doctors never te tested me for metal toxicity even though it causes all the symptoms their antidepressants claim to fight. Even my dentist wrote severely depressed on my dental records before giving me my last amalgam filling two years later, which have all been safely removed in quadrants by a holistic dentist. Mercury is bought from China, the largest supplier in the world. It has also been known that multi-dose vaccines in America contain mercury as a preservative, described in a code word called thimerosal. We have the most vaccines of any country with the most health problems. And in 1938, Leo Connor first identified and addressed autism eight, to eight years after the first use of mercury in vaccines. Autism and mental illness have become a national emergency, worse than poliomyelitis. This led me down the rabbit hole of what else the US government already knows and its branches shamelessly defend, claiming to be safe to put in our mouth and inject to our children without scientific proof that it's safe in all aspects, especially in accumulation through exposure which brought me to the filth in our tap water. There's nothing more important than the water we drink. It has been known that whatever is on the bottom of your shoe is in your drinking water. With over 80,000 chemicals, heavy metals like mercury and lead, pharmaceutical drugs and parasites, this water is recycled going house to house until we buy more fluoridated tap water from San Francisco who just opened up their groundwater for the first time since 1930. Most filters like Brita aren't effective against these toxins and are not certified to filter out certain contaminants like sodium fluoride, highly contaminated water we're bathing in, making our coffee with, cooking with, serving to our family and friends, feeding to our pets, washing our clothes, which is not only contaminated but completely unsafe. 95% of bottled waters contain half fluoridated tap water and half mountain spring mineral water, which is dirt. Well 17 at 225 Huntington Avenue sits less than a mile away from Bel Air Elementary School 
and contains arsenic, barium, cadmium, cyanide, sodium fluoride, thallium, and mercury. Mostly all are neurotoxins that affect the brain and accumulate in the body. Every thousand pounds of mercury released back into the environment by any means, special needs and autism rises. It has been known that sodium fluoride, mainly from China, has a dark history behind it. In 1945, the U.S. government started fluoridation in three states to help fight tooth decay without votes or through a judicial system. Sodium fluoride is slightly less toxic than arsenic and more toxic than lead. It's a corrosive and a neurotoxin. Over 50 studies have linked fluoridation with reduced IQ in children. And tap water has been directly linked to many diseases. 97% of Western Europe has rejected the use of fluoride as it should be an individual choice. Any, level, and any levels of contaminants in our water should be zero. I strongly recommend distilling your drinking water to eliminate any inorganic materials. As below, so above and beyond, all the problems I've spoken of are from or affiliated with the same intellectual elite government groups keeping us in the dark, sick and dying, and floating face down. These groups see everything through statistics. Well, here's a sample of what they see. One in four dead of cancer, one in three getting cancer, one in 60 autistic, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's on the rise. Department of Defense has named healthcare an existential threat to this country. By 2040, it is estimated that 100% of the federal budget will go towards Medicare and Medicaid. I'd like to end tonight by asking for support and representation in ending dental amalgam in San Bruno, ending fluoridation in our public water systems in San Bruno. I also ask that you help spread the awareness of contamination in all aspects. I ask that you initiate a plan with San Mateo County leaders and representatives throughout the Bay Area to address contamination in our water and mercury in dental and medical treatments. Contaminants have no physiological role in our bodies other than to harm us. And we are doomed to crumble with history recording with the greatest astonishment that those who had the most to lose did the least to prevent its happening. My name is James Spingola. I'm from No Shoes News. Brain on, shoes off. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you for your comments. Is there anybody else from the audience that wished to speak on items that were not on the agenda this evening? If not, we're going to go ahead and move on. Vicki, conduct. Item 9, conduct of business. 9A, authorized fireworks stand permits for the 2018, uh, excuse me, for 2018 upon finding that the nonprofit organizations meet requirements of resolution 2008-67, 2009-46, and ordinance numbers 1700 and 1840. I'm going to be presenting this to you. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. I'm Vicki Hache, the Acting City Clerk, and before you tonight is a recommendation to approve permits for 16 San Bruno based nonprofit organizations to operate temporary fireworks stands selling safe and sane fireworks at various pre-approved locations throughout the city from June 28th through July 4th. Applications were mailed to those groups in good standing. Completed applications were submitted to the city clerk's office by Monday, May 7th, then reviewed by a city council subcommittee on May 17th and found to be qualified based on the criteria set forth in San Bruno City Council Resolution 2008-67, entitled Rules and, excuse me, Rules and Regulations Pertaining to Temporary Fireworks Stands. At the application review meeting, the fire chief and police chief did a brief presentation to the city council subcommittee and city manager outlining their operation plans for the holiday period that adequately meets the community's expectations and needs. If approved, a safety meeting conducted by the fire and police departments will take place on Thursday, June 7th, and it is mandatory that an officer from each of the groups selling fireworks attends the meeting. Pursuant to San Bruno Ordinance 1840, permitted stands may sell safe and sane fireworks from noon until 8 p.m. on June 28th and from 10, excuse me, Yes, noon until 8, and then from 10 a.m. until 8 p.m. on June 29th through July 4th. Safe and sane fireworks may be used or discharged from noon until 9 p.m. on June 28th through July 3rd, and from noon until 11 p.m. on July 4th. I'll be happy to take any questions now. Any questions or comments 
from council? Not. <clears throat> we do know the subcommittee uh, did meet and also met with the chiefs to go over what their operations and procedures were uh, for this upcoming um, fourth prior and after. Um, we do need a motion and a second um, for to accept the report and the permits. All motion. Approval of the uh, recommendation and any groups. Second. It's been a motion made and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Ayes have it. Before we continue on, uh, just to take a, a moment, uh, it's not on the agenda. to go out of order that is not on the agenda. It's important uh, to me as the mayor, and I think my colleagues also share with me, that tonight we uh, had a lady here who was going to be taken over as the new city clerk, but what we have and have had is our deputy city clerk and our acting city clerk, Vicki Hache, who I've known for many years going back to the rec leader days at the San Bruno Parks and Rec. Uh, her dedication, her spirit, her passion for this community at all levels, at all facilities, throughout this community have never wavered and have always been something I admire and respect. And as we had a unique transition in our city's history to where the people voted for the first appointed city clerk, Carol, our city clerk, taking over until we found a replacement, obviously passed. Vicki, without hesitation or reservation, even on that day that I went and visited her, was willing to step up and made it very clear to me, I will be at that next meeting and we will continue on. She has taken the reign, she has taken the lead, and she has been a support to the organization. And when we had the active shooter at YouTube and I was at City Hall, she was there funneling the calls, helping make things happen as the community and our public safety personnel were taking care of what they needed to. So I want to thank you very much, Vicki, for all that you have done, all that you do, and for your acting city clerk and as the deputy city clerk on behalf of all of us, on behalf of myself as mayor in this community, we want to thank you. And I want to give this to you as a small token of my and our appreciation for all that you do. I couldn't put that on the agenda because she would know. Thank you. So. And maybe I would have been sick. <laughs> As you all know, I know I've said this before, it's my honor to serve you and the city of San Bruno. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Item 9B. <laughs> Receive oral presentation on issues and response related to, related to homelessness in San Bruno. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. I am here this evening to talk to you about the issues and concerns regarding homelessness, as well as the city's response and uh, what we do to address this issue. So why are we here? Why are we having this discussion? As we know, homelessness is a national, statewide, and regional issue that's not unique to our city. Um, however, we often receive inquiries, both council and staff, regarding what our approach is to deal with this problem. And it's productive to regularly look at how we address certain issues, including homelessness, and reevaluate whether there's more we can do or if there are other options out there that we can employ that may be more effective. And finally, we were directed to by the council, so we're here to, we're here to talk to you. <clears throat> um, so issue, uh, issues, the big broad issues to get things started, I think we need to begin with the premise that be, although you're receiving this report from somebody wearing a uniform, um, being homeless in itself is not a crime. There's no way to enforce or enact any 
uh, local or state ordinance that is going to simply remedy this issue. Um, there are associated issues with homelessness, as we've learned. Those do include, just to name a few, mental health concerns, uh, substance abuse, and for some, it's, it's, we're, in a, we're dealing with a situation where it's a lifestyle choice or, or individuals are resistant to the services that we are encouraging or offering uh, to provide them. Sometimes we're simply de dealing with limited resources. Uh, on, this is especially true at the local municipal level. And there's a perception or expectation out there amongst uh, individuals that may not be familiar with the approach that the city takes um, that we it's our responsibility to educate and inform them so that's those are some a uh, few of the reasons why we're here this evening so if we look at why we're dealing with what we're dealing with or not just specific to San Bruno but contributing factors to homelessness homelessness in general uh, we can differentiate those from um, some some of the situations that we have here and if we look at San Bruno specifically um, and ask ourselves why there are homeless individuals who prefer to frequent our city, we can look at a couple fact or a few factors. Um, the first of those is availability and proximity to resources. Uh, there are a number of resources uh, both in San Bruno and the immediate surrounding areas uh, for individuals that are, tr are trans or transient. And while it's important, and, and nothing can be more important than providing for others and to make sure that that people are well cared for and their needs are addressed. We also have to realize that the manner and location in which resources are provided is going to influence or dictate uh, where we where we see uh, transient individuals congregate or frequent. Uh, we're also uh, we, we pride ourselves on being a transportation hub. We have uh, there's plenty of ways to get to and from San Bruno. Uh, public transportation is is very available here and, and uh, that contributes to access to, to our city. And then many of the individuals we're, we encounter uh, living on the street or have some type of connection to the city and are comfortable here. We have a fairly mild climate. Uh, the city police department provides itself on uh, being relatively safe and individuals are not uh, as susceptible to, to violent crime as they may be in a bigger, uh, larger metropolitan area. So um, I, I'm going to show you a, a brief clip of a, a body camera, body camera footage that, I, that actually I was wearing um, last week. Um, this is right outside the police department near the BART station, and it's, a, it's just a brief few seconds. Um, but I'd just like to preface it by, you know, when the police department, interact, as, as I'll mention later on, the police department interact with homeless individuals on a regular basis, both in a proactive manner and in response to calls for service. In this instance, um, you can see the windows behind, the, those are police department offices, and it's really not a good idea to do illegal stuff right outside the police department windows, but they're mirrored windows, so not everybody realizes that. So on this particular day last week, we saw folks that were that may have been involved in, in uh, activity that may have not been legal. So um, we walked outside and, uh, and, and began to talk to them. And, and there's a couple different conversations going on here, so it's going to be a little bit hard to, uh, to hear or understand. And I'm going to put the microphone down to the speaker because I'm, that's about as technologically advanced as, as I get. Um, but you'll hear me ask uh, an individual, hey, what's the, what's, the, what's the deal? Why San Bruno? Why are people coming here? And uh, the quote is written up there. You're going to hear this response uh, is, is probably because it's like the perfect balance of resources and comfortability, you know. Um, and he articulated comfortability pretty good, and I needed, to pra I needed to practice that word tonight a couple times before I came here. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to play a little clip for you. Um, uh, there are a couple individuals that we're dealing with. I happen to be talking to somebody who's not on camera, so that's why there's, a, there's two conversations that are overlapping. Hopefully you can um, uh, distinguish my unique voice as I'm, uh, as I'm talking to, uh, to one of the folks that we're, uh, we're, we're interacting with. How come everybody's coming here? Except for uh, Woodstock. I have no idea, but... Yeah, no, I'll just go to the site. Mm -hmm. The perfect balance of... So I'm not sure whether you could you could make that out, but but the, the individual I'm talking to is, is basically that's qu that quote. There, um, Sergeant Blundell is talking to somebody else about his bicycle to make sure we secure his property. But I'm having a conversation with his with his uh, with his friend and, and trying to figure out why 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 here and um, and and that's the response that we received. Um, 
so it, moving forward with with why we're or maybe some contributing factors to why we we find ourselves uh, with individuals who who prefer San Bruno um, homeless individuals who prefer San Bruno um, there's a connection to the city in many cases um, most of our long-term regular homeless individuals the vast majority of them have some connection to San Bruno they grew up here they have family here they've lived here for an extended period of time and they're comfortable here and they consider this to be home and uh, if you have the conversations with them that's uh, that's the response you're going to hear um, I'll go back for a second I just don't I don't want to be distracted by the numbers uh, uh, in a in a subsequent slide I believe you'll see that um, those who don't do not have those connections here we typically see them only for a brief period of time for example I followed up with the individual we're dealing here and, and they were from the, the Central Valley and we're trying to get through, trying to make their way back to the Central Valley and and um, we haven't seen them since last week we kind of helped them and facilitated them a, a, a way to get where they needed to go and, and we see that a lot but there is a uh, um, effective avenue of communication amongst people who are seeking services and they know that they're available here <clears throat> So the next slide is um, is the 2017 San Mateo County Homeless Census. The county conducts a homeless census every other year. So the next one will be scheduled in 2019. And you'll see the numbers there, and um, the, the subsequent slide will, will try to explain these numbers. Uh, they're difficult to explain. There is a, a, a great fluctuation, not just in our city, but in several surrounding cities. And we'll try to, we'll try to go through that in, in, the, in the subsequent slide here. Um, the county um, likes to point out, uh, as, as, as I would, that you know if you, if you look at the numbers in the census, that there is a gradual decline in homelessness between 2015 and 2017 of 16 uh, percent. The percentage of homeless uh, individuals countywide that were counted in the city of San Bruno comprised 4.1 percent of the county's total homeless population. And our actual population makes up 5.7 percent so you can see the proportionality there however there's a significant fluctuation in the numbers uh, there's a a wide range of um, from year to from every other year census to census that is uh, that is a drastic shift um, this may reflect that you know homeless individuals are transitory and they, they, they it may be a fluid uh, situation or it may be a, um, a situation where the, the census is conducted in a unique manner every other year and it may bring into uh, question the credibility of those of those numbers because the, there is such a drastic shift based on uh, our individuals in the field and the work that we do with some of our partners we believe the number of regular homeless individuals in the city to be around 40. So when we talk about existing services, we do have one primary uh, area that seems to attract um, uh, homeless individuals, um, a place that does great work, provides valuable resources to people that really need them, and that is the Catholic Worker Hospitality House at St. Bruno's Church. Um, as you can see there, there's nine shelter beds there um, that can accommodate folks for a couple weeks, two to three weeks. Um, the gathering point or, or congregating point you'll notice is five days a week um, they're feeding breakfast and providing showers to individuals that need them they estimate that they provide these meals and showers to between 60 and 90 guests now not all 60 and 90 of these individuals are homeless or homeless in a traditional way that the way we receive calls for service they may be individuals who r truly need these services but don't experience the same shelter challenges that the individuals we see actually uh, sleeping on the street are experiencing they also um, have a couple homes in the city uh, one is a supportive temporary housing uh, single-family home it has five bedrooms and each bedroom is basically designated for uh, somebody who, who needs sheltering services uh, so it's more of a um, individualized uh, temporary transient type of environment there the second home is a another single-family home uh, designated for a family that uh, needs um, or requires some housing assistance and they try to do that at a very affordable affordable in a very affordable manner um, to provide some sustained housing for uh, for a family to, to use that resource this is just a partial list and this will be relevant in, in, in just a second but this is just a partial list of phone numbers when we have um, challenges 
um, seeking services that are at our disposal um, from the city's perspective. And, and I won't go through them all, but there's, that list is probably, that's probably a third of the list that, uh, that we have available to us. Our primary partner in, in when we talk about local resources is Life Moves. Uh, Life Moves was formerly known as the Envision Network, for those of you who may, may, heard, may have heard that term. Uh, Life Moves is a, is a program that, um, pro is a, it's, a, it's, it's a model that um, combines shelter and housing with, with comprehensive services, a case um, work type of approach that will enable homeless families and individuals to, uh, to return to long-term self-sufficient housing. Uh, the county has a contract with Life Moves. Um, frankly, we weren't satisfied with the contract. Um, we loved what Life Moves did, but they're spread too thin like everybody else is. So we uh, partnered with a couple of the cities when we were uh, confronted with some one-time grant funding and at the council's approval, we enhanced our relationship with Life Moves so they could do more for us in the city. Um, so that's where we're at now, working, working with them um, to, to do that. The reason we like Life Moves as opposed, there's a, there's a lot of service providers. There's a lot of service providers that provide services independently in San Bruno. Uh, the reason we like Life Moves is because of the goal. And the, and the goal is one that is a, a long-term, sustainable sheltering resource or, or sheltering solution to individuals who, who are living on the street, as opposed to some of the other groups that, do, that are excellent at providing services. But their focus and goal is more on just simply providing the services with no end game, with no, uh, no, no focus or emphasis on getting folks off the street, seeking long-term uh, housing or sustainable solutions to, to this problem. Right now, uh, Life Moves, uh, in, a, in, in, a, uh, in conjunction with the police department primarily, but also with some other uh, city departments, is working closely with 20 to 25 of the individuals that we, that we see regularly on the streets in San Bruno. Um, most of these subjects are resistant to services. Uh, it, it's, it, sometimes it takes a long time, and I'll, and I'll let them speak to this in a second. It takes a long time to build that relationship, build the trust for an individual to, to accept services and uh, move forward in the process to, to really seek a, a long-term solution to a, to a serious problem. Um, there's a, approximately eight individuals, and these numbers may have changed. They're about a week or so old that uh, we're actively working with in, a, in an intense manner that seemed to be ex, uh, agreeable to services that we're, um, that we're working with uh, now to try to, to try to pull the trigger on that. Just one, one quick story based on the relationship here. A couple Saturdays ago, I happened to be at the police department where uh, an individual, um, you could tell this, this, this person was down on their luck. Uh, they had shown up at the police department seeking help. Um, he had uh, recently, um, ended a long-term relationship, uh, lost a job, and had been living in a local motel until his funds had, had simply run out and uh, uh, was kind of in dire straits and, and, and needed help. Uh, we called all of those numbers you saw on a previous slide, and, and it was difficult to find resources on a Saturday afternoon, to be, to be honest. It was, it was difficult to find a bed, difficult to, to help this person out who was standing in, our, in, the, in, in the front lobby of the police department. Because of our relationship with Life Moves, I was able to pick up my call, pick up my cell phone, call Mark Saban from Life Moves on his cell phone. Um, he called me back within 15, 20 minutes, located a bed in Redwood City. A San Bruno police officer drove this person down to Redwood City, and we were able to um, to at least give the, give this subject a chance. He had three or four days in a shelter down there where they could provide him with the resources, provide him with opportunities to kind of help his situation. So that's. That's the basis of what we do, and we'll talk about its effectiveness in a, in a few minutes, but I wanted to give um, uh, Sherry Campbell and our Life Moves representatives a chance to kind of talk a little bit about what they do on a regular basis. I do want to point out that for those of you that know Sherry, uh, this is not her primary job or role. Um, she's pulled in a million different directions within the police department in, in, in responding to homeless concerns, which she's a great resource for the officers because they can let Sherry know, let Life Moves know, and, and it kind of uh, it, it relieves their burden of, of dealing with things because she has the, the connections. But um, I just do want to point out before they get started that um, this is not her primary role. She has uh, countless other roles, so it's, it's a difficult um, challenge for, for her. She does a great job at it, but it is just one of many things that she's responsible for. So Sherry, did you and Joaquin want to say sure. a few words? Hi, good evening. 
Um, so I'm Sherry Campbell, and I'm the support services officer with uh, San Bruno PD. Um, and like he was saying, one of the roles in my job um, is trying to assist our homeless subjects. Um, typically what happens is our patrol officers are kind of the first person to go out when we do get a call um, related to a homeless individual. Um, they go out and handle that call depending on what it is. Um, sometimes the person can get arrested or be cited or simply just be moved along. Um, when it's a person that we deal with repetitively, um, the patrol officers will get a hold of me, either come see me in my office or email me um, and let me know that there's someone that is either refusing the services that they've tried to offer um, or somebody who may want services. Um, depending on what the situation is, I'll always go out and make contact um, personally and try to just talk to them and see what the issues are. Um, sometimes there's some type of addiction. Um, sometimes they're just down on their luck. Um, other times there might be mental health. So a part of my evaluation is trying to figure out what the proper connection is. Um, I have a lot of resources, but it's a matter of what they're willing to accept. Um, one of those resources, which is huge, is Life Moves, which is um, what the chief had just talked about. It's one of our primary resources um, to help the homeless individual. Um, so when I am going to go out, whether it's a camp that we're about to evict or, or just somebody I want to make contact with, I call Life Moves and then we go out and contact them together. So I'm going to turn it over to Joaquin, which is our city of San Bruno um, outreach case manager with Life Moves. And then he's going to tell you a little bit about what he does. And then I think he's going to give you a very recent success story. Perfect. Hi, everybody. My name is Joaquin. I'm the outreach case manager for um, San Bruno at the moment. And the main focus of our, of our task is to engage the clients and those, like Sherry said, those who are repetitive encounters with the law enforcement are those who are long-term homeless individuals in the city of San Bruno. And these are the hardest clients to engage and actually engage them in services because they've been out in the streets for so long that to them it's now a routine system. And so when we approach them to offer them services, we have various entities who care about these individuals who want to offer them services. Sherry is uh, the first point of contact when these individuals are repetitive contact. And what she does is she'll contact me and refer the clients to me. She'll provide a description. She'll provide a location of where they tend to hang out. And then our goal is to come out and meet the client and engage them in services. Again, these are some of the most difficult clients because they've been out in the streets for the longest. It takes a lot of engagements and a lot of report and building report with the client. Um, one of the most recent experience I've had with a client is an elderly lady. She's been living in the streets of San Bruno for two years straight in her car. Um, she was parking at the town center parking lot. It took about a year and a half until she finally agreed to engage into services. And her, her, her growth and um, decision to actually engage in services was dealing with mental health and behavioral health. And I try my best to engage her and want her connected to those services, but it wasn't until she decided to do it on her own. And she came up to me and said, Joaquin, I finally did it. I went in and I connected with services. She is now on the verge to get in house. She signed her lease yesterday, and it's a Waverly Apartments in Redwood City. It is a mental health and behavioral health uh, apartment complex that are going to be receiving ongoing case management. And she's going to be moving in on the 31st of this month, so I'm really happy for her. And it's just an ongoing process, and it's, it's not cookie cut where you can know how long a client will go through the process. Some clients can take five months two weeks, some can take up to two years. It all depends the motivation and what they want to do and if they want to engage in the services. Thank you. Thank you. So moving forward, um, as we mentioned earlier, homeless is not a criminal justice or law enforcement issue. It's much more universal. So it impacts more than the police department. Um, although I'm here talking before you, this, this presentation is a, a collaborative effort and a lot of the information you're going to see in the slides was provided by, by other city departments. And it does touch um, a, a few departments within the city. For example, um, th this is the feedback that we received from code enforcement. I'd like to thank them for, for providing this. But um, their experience is they've reviewed, re received fewer complaints related to homeless in the past year. Um, they play a role in creating an environment that is less inclined to make folks comfortable um, in areas, in public areas. Um, in, for example, they, they, they've um, addressed vacant properties. The First National Bank building, which 
is gone now. Um, it was fenced off and is still fenced off. Um, historically, we had a problem there with homeless individuals, and when they took that action, we no longer experienced that. The same with 500 Sylvan, the 500 Sylvan site. Um, and they can also, through planning, um, create space that um, would uh, make it, um, I don't know, less convenient or less comfortable for individuals who are looking to just uh, to loiter in an area through lighting, through planning, through uh, an ergonomic design. Uh, they play a huge role in, uh, in addressing those issues. And, and if, we, if we keep that consideration in our, in our planning mind, hopefully it'll have an impact moving forward. Uh, community services and public works also plays a role. Oftentimes our community services staff in the parks and, and in, in areas where they're responsible for maintaining are the first to locate homeless individuals and they'll immediately get, give Sherry a call or call the police department and give us a heads up on where folks are so we can try to get out in front of that before it becomes a, a larger issue. They also uh, play a crucial role in uh, keeping um, vegetation and trees cut back um, which reduces the opportunity for folks to kind of have that hidden sanctuary where they may want to set up a, an encampment and uh, and can do so kind of out of sight, out of mind until it becomes until it becomes too late. Um, public works plays a, kind of a, a big role for us when we encounter homeless individuals um, who may have a warrant for the arrest or for whatever reason they they may need to go to the hospital or whatever it is. Um, we need to do something with their property, and oftentimes it's a significant amount of property. Um, Public Works is tasked with storing that property for up to 90 days, and they do a, they do a good job, even though their uh, their space is very limited and it can become challenging. And finally, there's the there's the police department. Um, we seem we uh, for obvious reasons interact with uh, transient individuals on, on probably the most regular basis of event of all city staff. Uh, we regularly respond to calls from residents checking the, asking to check on the well-being of individuals who appear homeless. Um, we regularly respond to complaints about why we're not just simply forcing people off the street or forcing people to accept services, accept um, assistance. As we mentioned earlier, we work uh, closely with Life Moves, and one of the things that was not mentioned, and they do, they do so much, it's hard to mention everything, but on a monthly basis, they have a multidisciplinary team which brings all the service provide all the relevant service providers together, and on a case by case ba basis, they go through each identified homeless person in San Bruno, the status of that homeless per, uh, homeless individual, uh, what resources have been offered, where there's been successes, where there where there's been challenges. So each each person that has been identified as being um, transient is, is is being addressed. Uh, we also facilitate the eviction process for homeless encampments. This can be a little bit more complicated. Uh, than, than folks may realize. Uh, we need to give a 72-hour notice for individuals that have established a homeless encampment uh, by law. Um, it's an eviction, just like you would evict uh, somebody from, any, from anywhere else. Um, the, the number is 72 hours. If it's city property, it's usually fairly swift. We have the authority to do that. Sherry's excellent at that and jumping on that. We have a lot, we, we have a lot of uh, other stakeholders or pr uh, property owners or, or um, in, in the city that are public entities, uh, include BART, uh, the airport, uh, San Francisco PUC, um, Caltrans. Um, sometimes it's a little bit more uh, time consuming just to get that eviction notice um, posted when, uh, when we're dealing with those external entities. Most of them, all of them are much larger than us. We're dealing with large bureaucracies. And once we get the notice posted, it, 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 it sets everything into motion rather quickly, but sometimes um, people ex ex um, become a little frustrated because we haven't uh, initiated that eviction process, and oftentimes we're waiting on an, an external partner to help us do that because it's their uh, it's their land. Uh, we also enforce state statutes and city ordinances when applicable. Um, we do this in a manner that is not uh, targeted at homeless individuals. Um, for what it, the the same statutes that we enforce in the downtown area, for example, um, would be the same statutes we'd enforce if anybody had committed that violation. So we're very, we're very um, careful to make sure that we are not targeting any one group and that uh, the, our enforcement of, of all statutes, state and local, are uh, conducted in an equitable manner. So as mentioned earlier, we, we encounter homeless individuals on a daily basis. Um, many of those instances are as a, as a result of a call for service. 
Um, just many of those instances are proactive, where officers see that, hey, there, there's a problem here. We need to we need to ask these people to move along, and we continually are asking folks to to move along when they're in areas that pose uh, that we know or can't, will anticipate will pose a problem wherever they happen to be to be loitering. We also have a, um, occasion to arrest um, homeless individuals who, who are um, living on the street. And as I mentioned earlier, the arrests we make uh, with these individuals are the arrests we would make for anybody that we, that we would find in the same area. But some of the violations that, you, that, we, that we typically um, encounter are drug possession, open container, uh, possession of drug paraphernalia, uh, public intoxication, theft, trespassing, assaults, all that stuff. Uh, we also make a lot of arrests of homeless individuals pursuant to arrest warrants. And the reason for this is um, the vast majority of the, the violations that I've just mentioned and many more are misdemeanor crimes. And the way that the law reads now, and, and uh, it, it has for some time, but the way that uh, felonies have been reclassified to misdemeanors, all we can really do when we arrest these individuals is, is request that they sign a promise to appear in court, give them a court date, and they are released on a citation. Typically, because they have transportation challenges and, and they, they have challenges getting to court, um, they will miss their court date. It will result in an arrest warrant, and then um, the, we'll, we'll make that arrest, and, and they'll have to go. They'll, then they'll be physically arrested. Typically, though, because they're only arrested on a misdemeanor arrest warrant, they make their court appearance the following day, and, and they're usually released because there's no cause to, to hold them. Um, and, and then reg uh, outside of the whole criminal element, um, we mentioned that there are mental health challenges associated with some of these individuals, and we do encounter those. And, and when somebody presents themselves to be a danger to themselves, a danger to others, or gravely disabled, uh, we will and, and can command that they are um, transported to a local hospital for a mental health evaluation. They can be held for up to 72 hours um, initially unless uh, medical professionals seek uh, a longer order, but uh, um, the p a police officer can make that determination and, uh, and send them to the hospital. Typically, they're not held for 72 hours. It's typically a, a six to eight hour um, turnaround before we see them back on the street. The note on the, and I, I, I know I keep uh, uh, repeating this, but it's important to know that we, we do conscientiously um, treat and interact and enforce ordinances and conduct evaluations of, of homeless individuals in the same manner that we would do for any other um, uh, individual that we'd encounter, no matter what part of the city that we're, we're, um, we're talking about. Uh, legal considerations and constraints. Our city attorney's not here tonight, but we have, uh, we have counsel, and, and he provided me with this information, so thank you to him. But uh, as uh, mentioned before, um, courts have identified or, or, or stated that cities are not allowed to criminalize the homeless. Uh, society is pretty much come to the same conclusion. Um, this includes not only establishing ordinances um, aimed at behavior we see associated with homeless. For example, if we, if we don't like what the homelessness are doing, we're prohibited from, from establishing ordinances specifically to target that behavior. It also addresses the enforcement of existing ordinances in a manner that is disproportionate and aimed at the homeless population. So we have to be very careful there. Um, so that's, that's pretty, much, pretty much it. Uh, the, it if we go outside of these constraints or considerations, the, there is the potential, and other cities have seen um, some, some liability associated with that. So are we seeing results? Um, as, as I've described, this is a collective and ongoing effort. Many different groups are involved in addressing it. It's not just the police department. Um, in working with Life Moves, uh, we're, you know, we, we've, we've, over the last, uh, I think it's uh, over the last year, um, we've see, we've found housing resources for 14 individuals. It's pretty good. Um, it's a it's a it's a pretty good um, number. Um, are we having an impact on the community? I don't know. It's hard to measure. Um, it depends on who you talk to. It depends on what part of the city um, you are uh, you are in, and uh, I guess it depends on your perspective. So that's something that I I don't have a solid answer for you. As I mentioned at the outset, uh, we look at what others are doing to see if we can learn. And these are some programs. I'm not going to go through each one, but you can see them up there of, of some branding or some names that some other jurisdictions have, have gone through. Most of them are uh, providing housing resources, mental health resources, social service resources, the, the same types of things that we do as a city and with our county partners. 
Um, within these two slides, there's only two areas that, that we have not um, gone to as a city or as a county, and one is on the first slide there is tiny homes. Um, that's been the, the subject of conversation. You may have seen it in the news. Oakland is now employing the tough shed homes, I think they're called, that you could, they're similar to the sheds that you see uh, that are sold at like a Home Depot type, type store. Um, and then the second area that we don't really um, uh, have a, a formal program for is reentry programs for those that are coming out of custody. Those are typically individuals who have served, served extended periods of time in state prison and then are being released um, into, back to the community and may not have a place to live. We don't run into that a heck of a lot. We, most of our homeless individuals that we see are doing short stints in, in the county jail based on what they're doing in San Bruno rather than, um, than coming out of uh, long-term prison sentences. But as you can see, uh, the, the other um, options, uh, we're doing almost all of that. The one area that's being done in other parts of the county that's not being um, uh, implemented in San Bruno is, is there have been other jurisdictions that have dedicated full-time law enforcement to this issue, not in, in an enforcement role, but in a uh, presence role. Um, downtown officers uh, in some cities, there's, there's been three or four success stories. Well, they're, call, they're calling them success stories in, in our county um, and other jurisdictions that still have these teams employed. Um, and it's basically none of us like to interact with law enforcement on a regular basis. When you're driving down the street and you see a police officer in your rearview mirror, nobody's comfortable. Well, the same is for homeless individuals. When they're sitting on a park bench in downtown, they don't want to interact with the police multiple times a day, every day. So the strategy that's been employed by these, these jurisdictions is to put police officers in areas where there is a, uh, uh, that are, it is frequented by the homeless and has an impact on the community. Um, in all instances, they're partnered with, uh, most of the time, Life Moves or some other type of service provider. What this has done is, in reaching out to these jurisdictions is it has had an impact. There, it, you'll, you'll talk to some entities that their downtown area is, is, is not frequented by homeless individuals nearly as much, if at all, as it was before they, they dedicated this, this personnel. However, where'd they go? Um, they probably went to other parts of the city or they probably pushed them to other jurisdictions. Don't get me wrong, I'd love to push them to another jurisdiction. I, I just don't know that, uh, that we have the, the, the wherewithal to do that. And our, our main goal here is truly to help these individuals and, and find long-term solutions. Kicking the can down the road, whether it's within our own city or to another jurisdiction, um, is probably not the, the most appropriate. There's a question at the bottom of the slide. We're often asked when people who don't understand the complexities of the homeless, issue, the homeless issues is, what are other entities doing that we're not? And I would suggest to you that the, the, the more effective question is what are we doing that others are not that's resulting in us seeing um, homeless individuals um, in our city? Because you know, we should pride ourselves on, on being compassionate and providing services. And, and, but we, like I mentioned earlier, we need to recognize that when we do that, people are going to come and use those services. And when they come to use those services, they're going to be where people can see them. And there's just no getting around that. So these are some potential alternatives. There's, they're not suggestions and they're not listed in any particular order. Um, again, we're, this, the city is rich with services for transient individuals. Um, maybe we take a look at uh, the availability of those services, how they're being provided, where they're being provided, and look at the impact that that's having on the community um, and, take a, and evaluate that. Um, I don't have an answer for that, just a suggestion. Uh, there are other um, cities across the state that have implemented enhanced regulations for the sale of alcohol. I'm not saying alcohol is the primary uh, cause for homelessness, but it's a contributing factor. And uh, discounted liquor, um, the little uh, uh, small um, containers of alcohol that are accessible um, fairly easily and seem to be uh, marketed at the front counters of local liquor stores probably doesn't help. And there may be a, there may be a way that we can look into that. I don't have specific answers for that. I don't know what's feasible. I'd have to check with our city attorney to see what's legal um, before we made any suggestions, but those, that's, that's an option that other entities have, uh, have, um, have looked at. Um, incorporate environmental changes, um, lighting in, in downtown areas may, may be enhanced. Um, you know, a lot is made of Posey Park, that, that they're, they're, uh, homeless individuals seem to be comfortable there. There is some bush and some, 
uh, concrete that allows them a physical barrier, even if it, even if they're still uh, visible. There's a phys there's a physical barrier there that gives them some sense of of concealment or protection, or that makes them comfortable. And maybe when, when we move forward with uh, with planning um, projects, um, look at how we're doing that, and maybe make it a, a, a situation where where those environments don't exist. We talked about police officers in areas where we're seeing these problems. And then, you know, there's always the alternative of identifying a place where we're okay with the homeless to be and, uh, and letting them know that and uh, monitoring that area on a regular, on a regular basis. And, and that's absolutely not a suggestion. It's just an alternative that other entities have done on a formal basis. If you look at Oakland with the, with in, in other entities do on an informal basis on a pretty regularly, regular, regular basis. We have not. You'll see that we we regularly evict encampments, whether they're hidden or they're or they're in plain view. When we do that, though, we see an uptick in our transient population in the downtown, more visible, and may have more a different type of impact on the community. So I'm, I promise I'm I'm wrapping up here. I, I apologize for taking so much of your time tonight. It's a it's kind of a complicated project that I, that 20 minutes will probably not or half hour will probably not uh, adequately address. But our plan to proceed is is to continue enforcing the those, the law the way we enforce the law in a fair and equitable manner. Um, quality of life issues are important no matter whether you're homeless or not. And if you have an open container or you're um, intoxicated in public, you know, we're gonna enforce that. Uh, we'll continue to work closely with Life Moves and uh, persuade people to provide resources. Um, we'll explore the, the, the possibility of amending local ordinance or adding local ordinance to, regarding the, the sale of alcohol. And continue to work with public and private property owners. Um, the eviction process, when we do get those encampments, um, if they're not in on San Bruno public property and San Bruno proper, they uh, they can be they can be tough to to get done to to address in a timely manner. So we'll continue to work with them closely. So I'm not sure I provided you with a, uh, a great deal of um, or any solutions at all, but uh, hopefully this is some information that that you and the public can use, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for the information and uh, for the in-depth report. King. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Sherry. Um, see Robert at the uh, podium. Is, uh, yes. Can we go ahead and see if there's anybody from the public that would like to speak, and then we can bring the, it back to council. Before the well. chief leaves, can you say anything more about the safe camp concept? Do you, do you have any feel that if we set up a safe camp, might that be a drawing factor that would uh, cause more people to, of homelessness on a, at least a temporary basis to move into San Bruno? Um, yes, I, I think that any time, I mean, the, the word the word gets out outside of San Bruno that there are services available here. And the same word would travel if there was a safe space. Um, not advocating for or against, I'm just saying that, yes, you would probably see individuals who learn of that safe space uh, want to come to San Bruno and, and, and take advantage of that. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, questions or comments from uh, council? Through the chair. Laura. First of all, thank you so much for the detailed presentation. And I think, like you said, it, it, you need a long, probably an afternoon to go through the work and the commitment and the dedication and all af 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 assets, no, aspects of the city from police, fire, staff. Um, I know it's a regular issue in every city. Um, you know, ask a San Francisco police officer and he'll tell you they deal with it on a regular basis, on a daily basis. But looking at numbers, and, and the thing that you you brought up is really the homelessness that we're seeing in the streets, and the, and the number in San Bruno was 26 in 2017. But the homelessness actually is, is an issue with people living in cars, people living in RVs, um, people living in tents, and that number countywide is, is pretty large. Um, and I, I hear a number of residents complaining about the increase in RVs or some sort of vehicle that's parked on, you know, let's say behind Melody Toyota on the streets. So that's an increase in, in the city's issues as well as just the homelessness. Um, so my comment is the numbers are increasing, um, although can we really make sense of these numbers, right? You look at these, these numbers and South City's got 172 one year and the next year they're down to 55 or they're at seven. It, it is an ebb and flow. As you mentioned in your report, 
transportation, you know, the bringing BART into San Bruno is an increase in the homelessness population in San Bruno. So I think the, the report tonight is important because San Bruno is doing a lot and does on a regular basis try to address this problem. Um, and we have, uh, I've seen it firsthand in areas where homeless will live, the encampments, and the, the brush is getting cut, cut back, we're removing barbecue pits from parks, and we're trying to alleviate the problem. So I say kudos, continue on working in the due diligence the city does and the staff does. Um, I, I very much like the program that we have with Life Moves, and I think every individual is a challenge in itself. And, Having the successes that you have is amazing to even get 14 off the street in a year because mental health is a huge problem. And them, the homelessness wanting to get help themselves is a personal issue and it's a challenging issue and they fight all sorts of challenges within their personal. So it's an issue and, I, and I'm glad to see San Bruno continues it. I just hope that the residents of San Bruno see this presentation, understand this presentation, understand what the city is doing because they are doing a lot. So thank you. Are there comments or questions from council? Through the chair. Irene. Thank you. I too thank you and Life Move. I, you guys do a fabulous job and it's not easy. Um, I, to add on to what Laura said, is there a way we can put this PowerPoint presentation as a direct link on our city website? But looking over it, maybe not the last few slides, but the, the parts that educate people that you, that say what's legal and not legal and all the different things that you said at mostly the beginning. So I think, I know it's going to be available at the council meeting if you go on YouTube or if you see it, but this way people could study it a little bit and, and look at it. So I think that would be important. And then the other thing, how long of a contract do we have life moves? It, I know the chiefs from the county pulled some money and we got an added person but how long is this going to last, and do we need to look at different funding sources to continue their good work? So the, there's, uh, to address your second question, there, uh, there's an, uh, an agreement with the county, which we hope is long-term and, um, and continues to be renewed w w with the county. That's great. Um, it, it just spreads life, moves staff a little thin. So what we did last year with, with your support is we did partner with uh, seven other cities to come up with a substantial um, amount of one-time monies, grant funds, to add staff. Um, what we're hoping, and it may be wishful thinking, is there's no time limit on when the, uh, for when we have to spend those funds. So we're going to keep this relationship until those funds are exhausted. At that point, and again, it may be wishful thinking, we're hoping to go back to the county and show them how successful this was and uh, see if they can dip into the Measure K funds, I believe it is, that they're using to, to fund this program to uh, maintain our current um, level of services, um, but there's no guarantee for that. So there's no time frame. It's not a one-year commitment. It's basically based on um, how ef efficiently we, we expend those funds. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. Mark, please. And then Michael. Yes, thank you. This is a, it's such a difficult subject to, to really solve. It's almost insolvable at times, but we can try to make things better. Um, and I, I, I like the, the, the number of other ideas towards the, uh, the end of your presentation. And so the next step I'm, I'm asking, I guess, my counsel of, I thought we had a sub, if, I believe we had a subcommittee on homelessness. And if we do, then I would suggest that they take on the next step, which is looking at how we can make things better by looking, examining the, the different things that you have in your presentation. So I guess I'll ask the mayor. I, I believe there's a subcommittee. There is. Irene and I had met. That's where we had got this with Life Moves, and we all sat with staff and all right. It was given information on uh, the services that are rendered as far as the individuals that received services, what the police department was doing, but it was more by names and things as such. Got it. So I would suggest that we would now open that up to our community um, to have a meeting to where 
we reach out to other individuals that are interested in, in tackling and helping with the homeless problem. Um, I see online that a lot of people are, they do complain, but they're also trying to figure out, well, what can they do? And I, I'm hoping that we could um, provide the forum to start talking about, well, what can the community do? We know what the police can do. We know, um, but what other uh, assistance can we obtain from our community? So that's what I, that's what I would like to, to see and, and with the council support of, of having a public meeting, a forum, to um, have our community, I mean, we have a Warriors game tonight, right? That's one thing, and our council meetings aren't generally attended very well anyhow, but having that opportunity for the public to come out to deal with one specific issue, and that would be the homeless. So um, that's what I'm, I'm asking for our, our subcommittee to look into. Michael? Chief, I, I just wanted to say that um, I'm always impressed with the, uh, the, the work that uh, you and your department do um, with the resources that you have. So this was a, a, a really great report, very comprehensive, and it's obvious that you are working really hard to address this very difficult issue. So I just wanted to thank you for that, uh, for the report, for the work that you're doing, and um, I really appreciated the comment that you said at the end where um, uh, I really do believe that um, you're, you're taking a very compassionate approach to this difficult issue. These are people that are uh, down on their luck. Uh, some of them are dealing with some very uh, difficult issues. They're dealing with difficult issues themselves. Uh, some of them uh, definitely need assistance, even if they don't realize they need our assistance. But you're doing a wonderful job, so thank you. Thank you. Just for me, I. You know, I could see the subcommittee reconvening to see if there are some explored, but uh, what I worry about is just to have a meeting to have a meeting to talk. Because uh, as we all hear, and I think the chief said something in this presentation that we don't really have to wrestle with. When I went out uh, three Sundays ago to the train station because I wanted to see the fountains when I went there, <clears throat> I ended up speaking to uh, five of the homeless. We spent about 40 minutes conversing. So to me, what you find out better is not to tell me what I, or for me to tell you what I think I know, it's about going out there and finding out what it truly is. You can speculate, you can believe, but unless you ask, unless you go out firsthand and check with folks, then who are we to sit up here and figure we have the answers? So that's where you maybe need to start. But ironically, one of the chief's comments was about services. Why were they there? They were there because they were waiting for the church, not, not it was a different church that was listed up there that was bringing um, food. So they know on that day, at that time, they come together because they're offered services. So really the community needs to have a conversation with itself about truly, what do you wanna do? I get emails and I hear comments about shut it down. That's why folks are here. Then you have others that say, but we need to be the city with the heart. We should do more. Okay, then I wanna know how we're gonna pay for it um, I remember before any of us, I believe, were up here, um, there was a time that the council tried to take some more proactive approaches that had a little bit of backfire from the community about, A, is it legal? Two, that we're being insensitive, that the council, then none of us, were being insensitive. But really what it brought to the chamber was a debate about those that want and those that don't want, and then you had citizenry against each other because they just had not the answer, unfortunately. They just had an opinion of what they either wanted to do or didn't want to see. So I think it gets really deep as far as what the community wants to do. Um, and I think it's, you can put folks in a room, but what's really the agenda? What really is legitimate and legal, which I think the chief said needed to go to the city attorney to say, because some folks have what they've asked to do, I don't know that it's truly, again, being homeless is not a crime. It would be the same thing walking down San Mateo Avenue and seeing somebody eat a sandwich on the curb. And because somebody interprets them to be homeless, they can't do it. But any one of us can. Well, that's what the chief's alluding to. People have to be treated equal. They can sit in a, in a park. They can lie in a park. It's completely legal. Just like you and I, not at night now, but in the morning. 
So it's about treating people equally and following the law. But I think, um, you know, for some of us, even we don't have the answer. We, we're all admitting that. So uh, if we're going to meet, I think we need to come up with some realistic solutions. I think, Irene, I like your idea about the educational aspect uh, because I think some of that was brought forward and we learned that as well. Um, you know, I, I think, again, really the community might have to wrestle with its heart and to say services will have folks here. And if that's what we want, then that's what we want. But we can't have it both ways unless we're willing to invest resources, staff time, uh, taxpayers' dollars into something more, housing or something that substantial. And then do we want to compete with the county? So I think we really need to, to, to look at that. Um, and, and budget time is coming up too. So let's see what resources we have available or are enhancements uh, um, eligible or can we invest? So I've rambled a little bit, but I think the subcommittee can, can look back at some of those things that might be realistic. I think the educational aspect, so people understand the website, I mean, that you suggested is great. Um, so those are my comments. But again, I want to thank you because I know it was, a, it was a long report, but I think it was necessary to get to the depth of truly what it is because it's no real simple answer. And I know everybody's got a different perspective on what they want to see. But anyway, we'll stop now. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Chief. So it sounds like what I did here, though, is I think we're all in agreement that uh, I think we continue moving down the, the path that we're heading. Um, I, I appreciated that in the presentation there was a plan to proceed. Um, it talked about continuing with life moves. It talked about exploring feasibility of amending local ordinances, Absolutely. enhancing regulations on the sale of alcohol, continue to work with the public and private property owners to prevent and address encampments, and to continue to enforce applicable local and state statutes in an manner. And I think we've all heard is is the public uh, knowledge in, in, in reaching out to the public. So there was a comment that I made in my comments, and Irene also did of that regarding getting some sort of version of this PowerPoint on our website. Um, I also think that uh, Council Member Marty Medina's suggestion regarding a public meeting to open it up for the discussion of homelessness is, I think, is a good idea because I think not having all the facts and the, the too much of the commentary by the residents who, and you see it on whether it's a Facebook post or a next door post, that what's the city doing, what's the city doing, and they really just don't have the facts. And so I think we need to educate them. And I think we need to do a better job of educating them than just having a presentation at a city council meeting. It's difficult for everybody to attend this. This is something that, you know, it's, you know, at the time it's 9.30 at night, they have bit jobs, they've got families. So open it up to a, a location and the feasibility at a time that makes it maybe more um, doable for, so for residents who care. And possibly hold the meeting somewhere in the San Mateo downtown area where there is a, a larger uh, uh, population of the homelessness. The subcommittee can, can look at it, and I think that's where you get you partner with folks, with the county, and you look beyond because, again, our community is going to be interested with, with San Bruno. Life moves. Uh, we have a contract ongoing that will be continued, as the chief already indicated, so that is already pr proceeding. Just look over your shoulder. Proceeding. Um, so we can, uh, again, we want to caucus with the city attorney because, again, on the alcohol aspects, don't even know if we can. To me, what the worst thing is, you, you bring folks together and say, we should do this, yeah, and well, we can't. So let, let us get our facts in order, too, to make sure what, what we're giving out is good, true, real information that's legitimate and legal. So we can, uh, the subcommittee can meet again. Next, Vicki. Item 9C, receive oral report on current development activity in the city. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. I'm extremely pleased to present this report to you tonight about current development activity here in the city of San Bruno. The news is extremely positive. Development interest and activity are both very strong here in our community. There are a number of projects, major projects, under construction currently in the city, and more projects are in the pipeline and under review. My intent tonight is to highlight some of the key projects and to respond to your questions regarding our current development activity. 
But first, I would like to talk a little bit about why are we experiencing this level of activity. First, as we know, we have a surging economy here in this region. Between 2010 and 2015, 72,800 new jobs were created in San Mateo County. Our location, our location, 12 miles south of San Francisco, proximate to Silicon Valley, and as the chief mentioned, we're a transit hub. In 2013, after several years of effort, the city council here adopted the transit corridors plan that provided a clear vision for what the community was looking for in the downtown and surrounding area, 155 acre area of our community, creating a transit friendly, transit accessible, mixed use, compact development area. And then in 2014, just a year later, you went back to the voters and Measure N was passed by 67% when only a simple majority was required to provide some incentives, some financial incentives to see the TCP, the Transit Corridors Plan, realized. The amendment to Ordinance 1284 covered areas such as increasing building heights in the TCP area, the Transit Corridors Plan area. It also increased residential densities and allows for above ground parking garages to meet our parking needs in this area. Creating a vision for a revitalized, compact, mixed use area, transit accessible, bicycle friendly, a place to gather, pedestrian friendly has been key. So these are some of the ingredients I feel that have really been instrumental in some of the ac development activity that we're seeing and it's robust. So at this point, let me go through some of our projects, some of the things that are occurring. Let's start with three projects that are in construction right now. We're very familiar with these. The Plaza Apartments at 406, 418 San Mateo Avenue. It's our first mixed use project in our downtown area. It's well under construction. It's three stories. 83 apartments, 7,000 square feet of ground floor commercial space. It's the gateway to our downtown coming from El Camino Real from the south. On San Bruno Avenue West, we have a medical office building also in the transit quarters plan. It's under construction. It's two, so it's two stories, it's 15,000 square feet, and that project should be completed sometime this fall. Another project, the third one, that's under construction and well under construction is a project in the Bay Hill area, the Bay Hill Office Park area. It's at 1250 Grundy. It's a 67,000 square foot office building for the SF Police Credit Union. Well under construction, should be completed by the end of this year. Also in the Bay Hill area, we have the Bay Hill Shopping Center. And I'm pleased to, to point out that we just issued a building permit to proceed with this project just this past couple of days. The intent here is really for a facelift for the Bay Hill Shopping Center to look at new facade improvements to kind of update, provide a more contemporary look for the shopping center to provide pedestrian pathways, outdoor dining areas, bicycle racks, landscape improvements. This project is soon to go into construction and should be finished about October of this year. We've been working with the San Mateo County Community College District and Skyline College directly to do a residential project on an eight acre property at Skyline College. Really two pieces to this, it's 70 units overall, 40 units are single family, residential, and 30 units are for faculty and staff housing. Total of eight acre site, the project has been approved, was approved in February of this year, and building permits should be issued in June, and there's about an 18 month construction period. I've got two slides on this one. The first slide was the single family residential portion and kind of the layout. This slide shows the faculty and staff housing.
going forward to a project that's in the pipeline under review. This project is on San Mateo Avenue at, at San Bruno Avenue at Huntington, to be more precise, Huntington and San Bruno Avenue. And this project is referred to as 111 San Bruno Avenue. It's directly across from the Caltrain station and really provides the essence of what we've been talking about in terms of the TCP, the Transit Corridors Plan, creating the opportunity to provide for mixed use development, ground floor commercial with residential units ab above, close to transit, transit friendly, really giving people the opportunity to, to walk to transit, to walk to services, and to provide housing near, near to this area. This project is about 60 units, it's got about 8,600 square feet of ground floor commercial. We're, we've been working with the applicants on this and actually staff uh, had a role in bringing together two property owners to really create a larger project more consistent with the TCP in terms of merging smaller parcels and to create a, a more real and, and feasible development opportunity. We're expecting this project to go forward to our planning commission possibly in June or July would be the next meeting date on this project. Another project here, and I'll correct the heading on this, the, the project is 271 El Camino Real, and this is a multi-family residential project. This is the site of the former Lee's Buffet, and staff worked with the property owner to have the existing building removed from that property. And as we've been trying to do, as there have been removals of existing buildings, we've been trying to make sure that the sites are cleared, secured, fenced, and then landscaped, because it does take some time to go from demolition and removal to receiving approvals for development and then construction. We want to make sure that during that period of time, which can be a few years in some cases, that the site is clean, clear, and secured. And you'll see that in this case. Right now we're working with the applicant. We've received an application for 24 units here. Eight of the units would be townhomes. 16 of the units would be apartments. We're working with the applic applicant to gather information and deem the application complete for processing. There has been a neighborhood meeting on this and we received some very valuable feedback from neighbors in terms of the interface of this project to the project, exactly the existing homes to the rear on Linden. And we'll be addressing that interface in terms of moving forward with this project. This is another project in the transit quarters plan area it's on El Camino Real. It's the existing Mills Park Plaza. It's a commercial development that you're very familiar with, one and two story existing development. And the idea here, it's about four and a half acres in total area, is to redevelop this site, redevelop it into two different development areas and create the opportunity for about 45,000 square feet or so of ground floor retail and possibly 400 dwelling units. This is another circumstance where staff worked with two separate property owners to bring the property owners together to encourage them to create a partnership or sale one to the other to enable, again, a larger uh, mixed-use project that's more in keeping with the transit corridors plan. Uh, this project, we just received a revised application for this site as the key property owner the GW Williams company that owns the Mills Park Plaza just came together with the Wel Welsh partnership, family partnership, and as a result, they've been able to add the furniture store property uh, nearby across the street from our library. And with that, they were able to modify the application, submit it, and now it's a project of about 400 units and again about 45,000 square feet of ground floor commercial. Uh, this project, we just received the revised application. It has already gone before uh, a neighborhood meeting group. It has gone before the Architecture Review Committee. So we'll be evaluating this revised application for completeness and for further processing.
There's been a site on El Camino Real long vacant and a site that required remediation, as you probably recall. The, the site is at 160 El Camino Real. It's next door to the Berkshire Hathaway Real Estate Company. It's been long vacant. It's a closed site in terms of remediation. The remediation of the site has been finished. And at this time, we've received an application for a three-story hotel, 34 rooms, a 34-room hotel. And that application is in and being reviewed by our staff currently. Next project, also in the transit quarters plan area, is a smaller project. It's an infill site. We have had this, this site um, in review for some time. There's an existing medical office building on this property that's been long vacant. It's a smaller site, but there's an opportunity to do infill here, residential infill, and there's an opportunity with our codes to put about nine residential units on this property. We have been working with the property owner. There has been a neighborhood meeting. Uh, at this point, we are waiting for some additional information from the applicant, and we expect to receive that shortly, within the next couple of weeks, and we'll be able to, with that information, hopefully deem the application complete for further processing and move it forward. The Crossing Hotel, the Crossing Hotel project is a project that's been around for a while. It's a proposed, and I'll, I'll even say approved, uh, better said, five-story hotel with 152 rooms and 3,000 square feet of meeting space. This is on El Camino Real behind the Jack's Restaurant on a vacant parcel of land that's been owned by the city. Uh, we do have an approved project, and we are working with a developer, OTO, and trying to sort out some things in terms of working with the Department of Industrial Relations to determine if prevailing wage would be a requirement for this project. We're, we've requested information from the DIR and expect to receive that shortly and then be able to pass that on to OTO, the developer, and hopefully be able to move that project forward. The budget mo motel site on El Camino Real, uh, a property that's uh, been in poor repair for many years staff worked uh, diligently with the property owner to work in the direction of really redeveloping the site. The, the building itself, the budget motel, really was pretty obsolete. The property owner was evaluating whether to rehab the building or do new construction. Uh, we encouraged, staff really encouraged, given the condition of that property, to, to go in the direction of new construction. The property owner agreed that the site uh, has been cleared of the old building. It's been secured, as you see, with the fencing and landscaping. And at this time, we're working with the, the property owner on a development proposal. Uh, they've shown us a proposed project. It's not been submitted, but something like possibly either uh, a mixed-use project with ground floor, commercial, and some sort of residential use above could be apartments above or the potential for uh, a motel. They're going back and forth on, on this concept and they're really working on a preliminary development plan. Mixed use, accommodation use, um, residential are all permitted uh, at this location. So we're really waiting to see what comes in the door. We've had a few meetings with the property owner's representatives on this property. Uh, the Bay Hill specific plan, this is a, an extremely exciting project for San Bruno. And as we know, and we've been discussing for some time, YouTube is proposing a fairly major expansion with our, within our community. And as we've worked with YouTube, we've indicated that we certainly want to work with them in terms of their business interests and expansion opportunities. But at the same time, we want to make sure that those expansion interests uh, are considered in the context of other property owner interests within the Bay Hill area and broader community interests. We uh, requested, essentially required, that a specific plan, a comprehensive planning effort be done for this proposed expansion, not to just take the proposed expansion on as an individual project, but to look at it in the broader context of impacts and needs within Bay Hill and within the broader community. YouTube has agreed to that. Uh, YouTube is funding the preparation of the specific plan. 
At this point, we have several concept alternatives, four concept alternatives that we expect to bring forward shortly, hopefully this next month of June. And that's after having substantial community outreach and engagement uh, with yourselves, with community members at a workshop, property owner forum, uh, et cetera. So we've reached out, received a lot of good information from our community. That information has been used by staff and the consultant team to put together four concept alternatives that will be presented again out to the public to, to receive feedback and to move in the direction of identifying a preferred alternative for how this area could be developed and redeveloped into the future. And that preferred alternative would then be the base for preparing the specific plan and doing a full environmental impact report. Uh, we're hoping that this project, it's, it's a very, very, um, it's complex, it's a lot of work, uh, it's very, very important project for this community. We're hoping to be able to complete it by the end of this year. Some other updates, uh, some other topics came up uh, in discussions with other staff members, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about those as well. In our community, we, we noticed that we heard from Melody Toyota that they were shutting down both their sales office on El Camino Real at 750 El Camino Real and also their service department at 222 San Bruno Avenue. Uh, we followed up with representatives of Melody Toyota and heard about this transfer, um, actually as it turns out, this transfer of ownership. We also heard from the Victory Automotive Group and Victory Automotive Group has indicated uh, an interest and has exercised that interest in acquiring Melody Toyota. So what you're seeing there is that Melody Toyota has uh, phased out and the, the new ownership group is the Victory, uh, Victory Group, the Victory Automotive Group. And they have taken over that property and are continuing essentially at this time to operate Melody Toyota. Our staff will be working with the representatives of the, the Victory Automotive Group to review with them the existing uh, conditions of CUPs, conditional use permits that are in place to make sure that uh, there's knowledge of the conditions and adherence to those conditions. So that's something we'll be doing with the Victory Automotive Group. The next topic is the shops at Tanferan. As all council members are well aware, a couple of years ago, the real estate arm of a pension group in Australia, QIC, acquired the mall itself, about 11 acres of the overall 45-acre property at the shops of Tanferan. There are other ownerships at the shops of Tanferan. There's Target, there's JCPenney, JCP, there's Sears, and then adjunct is BART. So there are different ownership groups and interests. We've been meeting periodically with representatives of QIC. They've indicated uh, a strong interest in reimagining the shops at Tanferan to create more of a destination to look at different types of uses there with the change in retailing with the internet, et cetera, and thinking maybe about bringing more restaurants, entertainment, perhaps even a boutique hotel, offices, a gym, a 24-hour gym. So really kind of rethinking how that property, the overall 45-acre property, could be developed or redeveloped over time. They have not necessarily produced a master plan yet. They've shown us you know, examples of some of the ideas they have, but they haven't really been able to put together a formal master plan for us to review yet. And there are a couple of things going on, just to make sure that you're aware of this, many of you probably are, but because of the different ownership groups, I think that QIC would prefer to um, control the property, the 45-acre property. I think that would be an objective of theirs. But in the meantime, if that's not possible, to at least bring the property owners together so that there's support for an overall master plan. So kind of working in two directions, try to bring people together so there's support for a master plan that they would lead or that in some way they would take uh, control of the overall property. That's one piece of it. The other piece of it is that they're working with BART and the BART board in terms of that connection between BART 
and the mall, and they'd like to have a stronger connection between a more attractive, stronger connection between BART and, and the overall mall. And in addition, QIC is expanding uh, uh, tremendously within the United States from Australia, and they've been acquiring four city properties, and I've, I've heard that they've added something like 220 or so new staff members. So there's, there's an expansion going on. There's kind of figuring out how to better control that property, and then there's coordination with BART. So we, we meet with representatives of QIC periodically. We've encouraged them to come forward with their master plan, but we realize that they have some business interests that they have to take care of along the way. Uh, the, the next topic is 500, the 500 block of San Mateo Avenue. This is the location where there was the Golden Shovel Challenge, where the Cal and Stanford students came together, and it's the area bounded by San Mateo Avenue, Angus, Mastic, and Sylvan Avenues. And the students from Cal and Stanford worked with our staff and with our community and our community leaders on looking at with the benefit of the transit quarters plan because that's the governing docu document for that area. What could that one block area look like in the future? And they came up with some development scenarios and phasing um, ideas for basically mixed use development. They had everything from micro units, micro residential units to a plaza, uh, variety, parking, just a whole variety of things. Very, very uh, informative, uh, very helpful. Uh, the interesting thing is that some of the property owners within the 500 block of San Mateo Avenue got interested based on that work and have been contacting staff periodically and are kind of interested in bringing together a number of property owners in that block to see if something like uh, what the students put together and in accordance with the transit quarters plan could be assembled, uh, assembling property owners and whatnot and bring that forward to the city, including looking at our city parking lots uh, in that area and looking at some sort of public-private partnership where, where perhaps a parking garage uh, could be built along with residential units and commercial, et cetera. Again, the concept in the TCP is to kind of have a more traditional retail frontage on San Mateo Avenue and in any case, for the parking garages, kind of wrap the parking garages with attractive development. So those, those are uh, some of the topics that, that staff members brought up uh, for me to share with you. And I'm, I'm here to respond to any of your questions regarding these development activity projects that I've highlighted or, or other current development activity that you may be interested in that I could respond to, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you, David. Questions, Michael? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, so David, for starters, thank you for the, the presentation. Uh, back in, I think it was January, Laura and I had a similar version of this presentation, and I, I thought it was really interesting then, and I, I still think it's really interesting. And um, it, I, I definitely appreciate having this sort of global view of all of the different projects at once, because it is hard to keep track of everything, and yeah. sometimes we forget about everything that's going on. So I, I believe it gives us an appreciation for everything that you and your department are working on, as well as uh, helping us realize the full impact of everything that's going on in the city. So thank you for, uh, for putting this together. Uh, your comment on the, uh, the fences, I, I just wanted to comment that I, I have noticed that a lot of the vacant properties are, look a lot nicer. They all have the the, uh, the nice fences and they're being maintained fairly well. So uh, thank you again for your attention to that. I, I, I know it makes a, a huge difference. And in the past, we did have issues with these vacant lots and yeah. you've been staying on top of them. So that's great. A lot of the uh, projects I saw in the presentation are three story projects, which I thought was interesting because uh, th when we passed measure N, you know, we remove that height restriction, but a lot of the projects are still coming in in that size, which in my opinion anyway is more appropriate for a, a lot of this area. So mm -hmm. I, I was uh, pleased to see that a lot of these proposed projects are coming in within that height limit. Mm -hmm. But to that, um, I had a question from somebody about the plaza apartments, which is mm -hmm. 
labeled a, a three-story unit, but it does appear to have mm -hmm. sections of it that right. go to a fourth level. And right. so my question is, what constitutes a level? Mm -hmm. are, are we allowing, mm -hmm. say, portions or portions of a, of a story to exceed beyond something, even though it's being um, basically approved as a, as a three-story, you know, how does that fit in? Sure, I'd be happy to respond to that and use that as an example. There, there are two factors apply, that apply. One is stories, the other is building height. So for Measure N, for example, in the downtown area on San Mateo Avenue, the, the allowed building height per Measure N is 55 feet maximum. In terms of our munici municipal code, we do allow for loft space, and so loft space is what you're seeing with the plaza project. So for example, as you see the, the fenestration, the windows that you know suggest as you look at it, a fourth story or floor, actually those areas are meeting the definition of loft space and basically what that definition is is that as viewed from the level below in the loft space, it has to be um, open uh, to the area below and overall the loft can't be more than 50% of the area immediate be immediately below. The plaza is within the 55 foot maximum height limit for um, the TCP per measure N and the areas that you're seeing, the, the community is seeing, uh, is um, loft space and it does meet the municipal code for lofts. Okay. All right. So they're, they're lofts, basically. They're lofts. Okay. They're, All right. Thank you. They're lofts. Yes. Other questions or comments from council? I have a question. David, is a copy sure. of this report or something like this on our website? I, I know that there are certain projects around, but yeah. all these, I mean, this is a great report. And I think like Michael said, when we first uh, joined the council, it was really good to get an overview of all those projects because residents are interested and it's so good to see the work that's being done and, and what's happening in the future. The development activity report is on the city's website um, within the community development department. I've added a few projects here and what I'll do is I'll work with staff and we'll update that development activity report based on this presentation tonight to expand the number of projects and maybe some of the detail as well. So we'll do that. Appreciate that, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I just, yes, I just want to thank you, David, for all the work you've done. I know a lot of the changes and a lot of the cooperation between different um, property owners is a directly a result of your efforts. So I do want to thank you. I know San Bruno will benefit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Marnie? Yes, thank you. It's, it's, it's great getting an update to, to see how everything's working out. Um, I really appreciate the effort that it took to put the nicer fencing around, mm -hmm. the, the, the demolished building. Mm -hmm. um, the property at San Luis doesn't have that fencing, but I'm hoping that now that they're in that preliminary planning stage mm -hmm. that they go ahead and put that mm -hmm. fence up because it's pretty unsightly. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they let the weeds get up pretty high and um, it just doesn't look good on our El Camino um, and also the gas station over there along San Bruno Avenue north of 111 San Bruno Avenue it, it's, um, it's it's it looks really rough mm -hmm. and um, some some attention there and cooperation from the tenant or from the owner would be would be great okay uh, we'll look at those for sure um, the one question the clarification uh, in the process so the community for the for Mills Plaza development, it was around 329 units originally, or somewhere around there, I can't mm -hmm. remember. But so, how does that work now? Since the the revised plans is another 70 units, mm -hmm. does work? How does how is that going to work with the community uh, outreach and, and uh, meetings? That project. Uh, we'll need to go to the architecture review committee would be a next step. Uh, at this point, we did have the neighborhood meeting. We had a, a good turnout at a neighborhood meeting. 
We did have a pre-submittal meeting, which is required uh, per the TCP and Measure N in terms of the uh, mixed use to residential transition measures. So we did do that and we did get uh, a lot of good feedback. Actually, in terms of adding this piece, we were encouraging, staff was encouraging that this piece be added because there was some discussion about creating, for example, view corridors uh, because this is a project that actually is being proposed at five stories. Uh, it's allowed on El Camino Real to be up to five stories or 70 feet. It is being proposed uh, as five stories. Some of the comments that we received both at the neighborhood meeting and at the architect review pre-submittal meeting prior to submitting an application had to do with opportunities for distant view corridors. We're thinking that actually there's going to be a greater opportunity to do that with this additional piece of land. So I would imagine that all the comments that we received both at the architectural review committee meeting and at the neighborhood meeting would be used um, and we would review the application. Um, as we go to the architectural review committee, we'll summarize those prior comments and to the extent the applicant has or has not addressed those. And so it would go to an architect review committee meeting first before going on to planning commission and then on to city council. So there would be those noticed meetings and hearings um, going forward. We would not go back. Uh, we would go forward, but we would certainly bring forward all the past comments. So I understand. So the residents that showed up to the first meeting um, are they going to get another notification that there was a, a change in the plans from yes. 330 to 400? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And then they can at the later at the later meetings they, they they'll address the comments. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then finally, David. Yes. Thank you for the report. I think it's important. Um, I know we're going to maybe do another one in about four months or so, and just to keep the community updated, the council updated, and I think that's uh, some interest I've heard uh, from council last year, and so we wanted to keep that going, but I appreciate that the time and effort uh, that you placed into that to give us an update. Thank you. You're very welcome. Item 9D was pulled earlier on the agenda. The next item is 9E, adopt resolution authorizing the purchase of voice call recording system from Gocerico, Inc. and installation by Telecommunications Engineering Associates in the total amount of $35,030 and appropriating $35,030 from the Equipment Reserve Fund. Good evening. Again, I apologize that you have to hear my voice, but I promise to be much more brief. Uh, the police department currently uses a product called voice print to record our police radio traffic our 911 emergency calls and our business line any call that into the police department or outside of the police department is recorded audio recordings allow dispatchers to immediately review telephone calls and radio traffic to determine whether or not crucial information had been missed the recordings also serve as evidence in a, in criminal and civil litigation the police department receives several requests each week from the district attorney's office to produce these recordings in preparation for trial and other court proceedings. The voice print system was installed in December of 2002. It was upgraded in 2009. According to the manufacturer, the estimated life of this product is six years. The current system has exceeded, exceeded its serviceable life. It's become unreliable and it's no longer supported by the vendor. The police department has received quotes from three different vendors to replace this recording system at a cost ranging, ranging from $31,030 to $34,081. Staff has reviewed all three quotes and has identified Gocerco Incorporated as the preferred vendor for the purchase of a recording system identified as a Ventide. Telecommunications Engineering Associates, our radio maintenance contractor, will assist in the installation of this equipment at, at an additional cost of $4,000, resulting in a total cost of $35,030. Funds for the replacement of this system do exist in the Equipment Reserve Fund. Therefore, staff is, request, is requesting the appropriation from the Equipment Reserve Fund in the amount of $35,030 to purchase and install the Inventide recording system. 
concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions or comments from council? Anyone? This is a resolution request. Any action? I'll introduce the, re the resolution. Council Member Medina? Aye. Council Member O'Connell? Aye. Council Member Salazar? Aye. Vice Mayor Davis? Aye. Mayor Medina? Aye. Next item is item 10, comments from council members. Any council members with comments? You're, you're asking me at the last minute. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Okay. So. That'd be my point. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go for it. I, I should leave it to the police and fire, but. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and go, st go first. Okay. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Marty. Well, this Friday, um, I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure out the swearing-in ceremony. Tuesday. For next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. I bet it's right here. Uh, Tuesday the 29th, 6 o'clock, in the Senior Center, um, we'll be swearing in um, some promotions and some new uh, hires. So if you're available, uh, come by and check that out. And uh, I wanted to thank uh, everybody involved with the Police Recognition, recognition Day at Tanfran. I know it was briefly mentioned, um, but it was really a nice event. Um, having the canines there and having so many different uh, police officers from different regions and um, thank the Crime Prevention Committee and CERT for being there with their tables and everybody involved. So it was a job well done. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Any other comments from council? If not. We do have a closed session this evening. This is a public employee appointment, employment pursuant to government code section 54957 of the city manager. <clears throat> and before we adjourn, <clears throat> we do want to adjourn in memory of someone who uh, passed away a couple days ago, Lara Gruel. For those that you know, she has uh, blessed us here at the San Bruno Senior Center for many years. She began volunteering at the San Bruno Senior Center over 25 years ago after her husband passed away and she was looking for something to do to occupy her time. Immediately she became involved in many of the planning committees at the center, especially the program and special events committee. She served many years on the senior advisory board and volunteered at bingo for many years as well. She loved to plan trips for the seniors and the Reno snow train the Branson, Missouri trips were among her favorites. Loretta had a unique ability to get people involved and wanted to enhance other people's lives. She began involved uh, and began involvement in as a liaison with Jackie Spears office and helped organize the seniors on the moves. Initiatives and workshops. She was an advocate for volunteers and passionate in wanting to help people who didn't have a voice. Loretta was severely injured in September of 2010 in the pg and &E explosion. She lost her home, which she rebuilt. When she recovered, despite a stroke, a stroke she suffered, she returned here to the Senior Center, who, as she also did, serve on the Senior Advisory Board. She has continued and was continuing to serve in many capacities, as well as during the daytime bingo. She has and had an incredibly positive attitude. She was always smiling, enthusiastic, fun-loving, even silly, and loved to have fun with everybody here. She was loved by many and will be missed. And her services are tomorrow at 4 to 8, Chapel Highlands and Millbrae. And so if you would give, uh, and please close this meeting in a moment of silence in her honor and memory. Thank you. The next regular city council meeting will be held on June 12, 2018 at, San, at 7 o'clock here at the San Bruno Senior Center. Please, everybody, have a safe and enjoyable Memorial Day.